Welcome to the Growth Guide Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Murphy. Every week, I talk to authors, subject matter experts, and millionaire mentors to share the lessons that will help you and me be better, achieve more, and become financially free. Today, I enjoyed my conversation with Kelly and Juliet Starrett, founders of The Ready State, a media-based health and wellness company. The Ready State's client list includes the U.S. military, professional sports teams, and Olympians. We talked about their best-selling book, Built to Move, which provides an easy-to-use formula for basic mobility maintenance. It introduces readers to a set of simple principles and practices that everyone can work into any busy schedule. It will lead to a greater ease of movement better health, and a happier life doing whatever it is you love to do and want to continue doing as long as you live. Vital Sign 1 is a really fun test and experience for you, your friends, and your family. I hope you enjoy and get out of this conversation as much as I did. Juliet and Kelly, welcome to the show where I'd love to start before we dive into your book, Built to Move, is if you could give a brief intro to our listeners who may not know you both yet. Oh, let me introduce Juliet Starrett. Oh my God. I've never had the, never. Okay, let's go. Lisa, our podcast uh, director is laughing right now. All right, (laughs) let me introduce Juliet. Juliet is a Taurus. (laughs) <laughs> no, honestly, Julia is a three-time world champion, attorney, co-founder of all our businesses, reformed attorney. That's better. Like you retired, um, I like to say. Superstar brain has been the driver and partner of all of our projects all the way back from opening our gym since 2004. How'd I do? Pretty good. Pretty good. Amazing woman. Um, let me introduce Dr. Kelly Starrett. Um, he's a really good dancer and was in a folk dance troupe as a child. Um, That's true. Loves to move. We like to say that he has toddler joints. He's the largest, most flexible human um, in the known universe. Also but, true. but um, you know, he and I co-founded San Francisco CrossFit together in 2005, and also the Ready State. And he is the New York Times bestselling author of now three books, and um, also Wall Street Journal bestseller of a few books. And his title at the Ready State, we oh. struggle to find a title for him um, because. You know, I'm always sort of the behind the scenes person and he's the front of the scenes person. And so lately his title at the ready state has been talent. Like somebody just, do? you hired. That's good. We'll take How it. How did I do? We'll take it. How did I do? What, what do we need to Loves add? dancing no, I, and I, I, is talented. I, one of the things I would add, and, and we're going to get into it in, in a bit of a definitions for, because some people still don't necessarily know this whole mobility versus flexibility. And when I was talking to my wife the other night over dinner, one of the things I said was, I felt as if the ready state, as if you as a team had really popularized and brought to the forefront, the idea of mobility as something we want to attain and achieve in sport, in life. And so maybe why don't we start there? What, for, for the listeners, what is mobility? Why do we want it? And how does it relate to flexibility, if you will. Well, I'll let Kelly, Kelly take the technical part of this, but you're right. And thank you for yeah, noticing. You take the fun part. Go Kelly ahead. Kelly definitely is the person who popularized the use of the word mobility. No one used it. And sometimes we feel that, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, a heavy, a heavy chain attached to us because it's not the most sexy word on earth. But Kelly definitely was a person who sort of brought it into the forefront of gyms and, you know, athletic training facilities. And what I, I'll let him give a technical definition, but we've really evolved our definition over the years. And part of that has been in connection with our book, Built to Move, that we'll be talking about. But we've really tried to sort of evolve and make more accessible the definition. But I'll let Kelly take the technical part. Do you want to say what the definition is? is Do you want me to say the accessible definition? Okay. So we now define mobility as the ability to move freely through your environment without pain and to be able to do the things you want to do with your body physically. 
whatever that may be. So we talked a bit about mountain biking beforehand. We obviously all share that as something we like to do, but everybody likes to move their body in some way. And that's a very individual choice, but mobility, having mobility gives you the freedom to be able to do that and freedom to be able to do that without pain. One of the things that we are always trying to do is maintain people's movement choice and movement options. If you can only squat with your feet set at a certain position, position, turned out a certain amount on one side, you have to put the bar in a specific position to hit depth on this one thing. That's not a lot of movement choice. It's almost like a way of thinking about it is if your movement choice and how, how you want to choose to move or solve problems is a big corridor. We want to maintain the width of that corridor for as long as we can. What we don't want is to start to end up in a very narrow hallway where we don't have a lot of movement choice and a lot of movement solutions. It turns out that the easiest way to do or think about this sort of at a technical level is to say, do you have access to your native range of motion? The range of motion that every physician, physical therapist, Cairo all agrees on within five degrees of what you should do. And oftentimes mm. We never, ever look at that. Does someone have access? Do they have full hip flexion? Can they bring their knee to their chest? Or do they have to spin their leg out wide and push their knees out and squat in some position because they can't squat down in any other way? So oftentimes we fail to appreciate that people will move in a certain way to solve a problem. And that way is fine until it is the only way or until it's a painful way because it the way that you're solving it doesn't necessarily hint at the best way to generate force, to the best way to move, to maintain your movement choice. So yes, you can run down the field like a duck, but I guarantee you, you cannot cut or pivot or jump or extend your hip as powerfully like a duck. You just can't, you can't plant like a duck and, and turn. So what ends up seeing now is that, well, the question is, why are you moving that way? And if we come back to that native range of motion, ultimately we're looking at, can you access what your tissues are supposed to do? And do you have control over those things? That's the technical definition. But ultimately, as Juliet points out, it's really, what is it you want to do? The school of performance, of strength and conditioning, of gymnastics, of martial arts has informed us for generations of the best positions for the shoulder, how to train the spine to move and to be stiff. All of that language is there because human beings have been obsessed with lifting, running, fighting for as long as there have been human beings. We can then map that into formal training or formal range of motion. And suddenly we have a unified field theory. And that's what becoming a supple leopard was all about. And one, one of the things you talk about that I think is very important in, in the book is this idea that we want to be able to move in these positions for what you describe as the long game. And so, <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to have you color in for the reader. What do we mean by the long game and, and how does using our infrastructure help us maintain Ooh, that infrastructure I, uh, I like so that, that the, you know, the mobility primes us for life? An easy way to think about this is let's, there are many ways to come at this. Let's say, let's, let's take a 30,000 foot view. The number one reason people end up in nursing homes is they can't get up and down off the ground independently. Mm -hmm. So what we have here in opening the, the test, opening the book, the first test is the sit and rise test. Just lower, cross your legs, lower yourself to the ground. And then without putting a knee down in that, from that crisscross applesauce position or without putting a hand down, can you rise back up? Well, a lot of people struggle to even get in that position. A lot of people struggle to get up and down that position. And what's interesting is that that position requires not having full range of motion that requires that position doesn't ask you to use your ankles in some kind of crazy pistol position. You don't have to be that strong to do it because we see children do it all the time. So what's going on there? Well, what's going on there for most adults is they don't have access to this native hip range of motion. Subsequently, they can't get up and down off the ground. And that's an allegory and an excellent data point to show that you're going to have reduced movement options, which means things like less power, less force production, less balance, less movement choice. And if you fall on the ground and you can't get up and down off the ground, that's a problem. I would just add to that. We, when, when you ask us about the long game, what I think about is we have an obsession with the word durability. We actually don't 
love the word longevity. And the reason for that is I think most people probably fall in the same camp as we do, which is we don't really actually care how long we live, is it health span? especially right. if you know, the last 10 years of our life are in a skilled nursing facility where we're being cared for by our children. What Kelly and I want is to have durable bodies for as long as we're alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by durable is, you know, A, the ability to do all the things we want to do physically, whatever that means to us, again, very individual. And B, that also means a body that's sort of ready to take the hits, you know, whether that's a disease or, you know, a really stressful time at work, a divorce, a move, a, you name it, you know, we're all going to be taking hits from, you know, either a health standpoint or a stress standpoint. That's the human condition. And what Kelly and I want to have is a body that can, can best buffer that. And so that's why we love the word durability. And what we want in the long game is to have durable bodies. So let's rewind because it's before we jump right into the, the vital signs and the solutions, let's talk a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve for. So we want durable bodies that are lasting a long time. And, and I love stats as an accountant, uh, which is what I play in my day job and, and most of my life. So the, I'll pull out some of your stats. 73% of adults in the U.S. are overweight. 16 million adults have chronic back aches. And, and then a line that I love, we're taking off the gloves early. We've become fatter, sicker, achier, less fit, are getting more joint replacement surgeries. The list goes on. So before we dive into the solutions, how did we get to where we are today? Well, I think it's a few things. You know, Kelly and I, are deeply members of the health and fitness industry. We've been working in this industry for almost 25 years. And we think that we have honestly done a terrible job of making information accessible and relatable to a wide ranging group of people. I think what we've done in our industry, if you think of the health and fitness business and health and fitness enthusiasts as a vertical We've done a really good job of making ourselves more optimized within that vertical. You know, we all track our sleep and have, you know, take the right supplements and we can count our macros. And, you know, we, we've just really gotten very sophisticated both as individuals. And then we've also been able to translate that to sport. And one example I'll give you is I was a division one rower in college in the nineties. And in many ways that was like the dark ages. We had no idea about nutrition, no coaching on recovery. I mean, it, we were in the era of like, work as hard as you can, you know, until you're injured and then you retire. That was the universe we're in. And when, when I look at the advances we've made in athletics, it's been huge. But again, that's still just serving like 1% of humanity, right? Mm -hmm, These are like mm -hmm. serious athletes and then enthusiasts like Kelly and I. You know, we've done a great job of optimizing ourselves and we really have not cast a wide net. We've left people behind. And then I think the second piece is, you know, we've taught everyone that health and fitness is something that can be done in a one hour block of your day. And we think that that's been a big mistake. We've told everyone, go to your one hour orange theory class, get on the Peloton for an hour, go to your CrossFit class, whatever it is that you like to do. You check that box of health heroism, and then you basically can just ignore your health for the remaining 23 hours of the day. And what we found is that the practices that we use in this book actually move the levers for us and for the professional athletes we work with more than formal exercise. And that in order to feel good in your body and be healthy in, you know, air quotes, healthy, you really actually have to care and feed your body all day, every day, but simultaneously that can be done in the, in the context of a busy time crunch life of two people raising kids. What would you and, add to that? No, let's go. And, and that's what I, I loved is each one of the ways that you did it. And, and so for the listener, what Juliet and Kelly have done is identified 10 vital signs that you will be able to test yourself at home and say, how do I perform against where I should be or where I may want to be? And then how do I go from where I am to where I want to get to? And what really jumped out at me is a super accessible. So everybody ought to be able to use these and say, okay, here's how I'm going to move forward. And B, each one of them felt like a book in and of itself. So, <laughs> so like there is a lot of it's meat dense. on this bone. It's dense. Yeah. It's, dense. yeah there, it's not light. There's a couple of things here I think that are worth jumping in. One is that the concept of the vital sign is new. 
people become sophisticated. They're, they're measuring their oxygen saturation when they get sick. They have these aura rings that look at this. Your, your Apple Watch will tell you really in-depth metrics about your heart. Well, what we want to do is say, okay, those are really useful. Everyone understands the concept of blood pressure. So how do we expand that and create references based on data, based on research, and based on what we know to be the biggest hinges or the smallest hinges that open the biggest doors. And what we've done then is split the book and basically into two categories. We have a set of categories in vital signs that are around, we can think of them as physical behaviors, getting enough sleep, walking enough, really looking at how the, the food that you're putting in your body, specifically micronutrients, protein, and fiber, how they impact your co tissue quality, because we can't talk about those things and not talk about your range of motion, which means that oh, on this other side, we also are going to look at how well you move in the environment. We're looking at your hip extension. We're looking at you squatting, mm. looking at these fundamental shapes and patterns, but putting them into ways that don't feel technical and don't feel exercise-based. And what ends up happening, as you said, each one feels like a book unto itself, is that each vital sign creates a category or a sort of a valence of behaviors around it, right? Sort of, it sort of colonizes a set of behaviors. So for example, if you want to sleep and fall asleep, chances are you probably need to walk more during the day to accumulate yeah. enough exercise fatigue or non-exercise activity and sleep pressure that you actually fall asleep. You also start to make decisions about when you're going to have caffeine because that late caffeine bump that you're using to get by is going to impact the quality of your sleep. So there's a whole host of things we can begin to think about around each one of these behaviors. And also that illustrates the fact that these behaviors all integrate. And that since we are a complex system, most of these behaviors are tightly coupled. So that when you start to lean on one, particularly a blind spot, we tend to see upregulation across the system of behaviors. So impact one and you'll start to see your other uh, you know, vital signs start to improve. And subsequently, what ends up happening is that we create a really simple roadmap with easy to see benchmarks that move away from good and bad to, hey, this should be something maybe you need to focus on. And here are some ways to do that. And, and when you look at, so we have 10 vital signs, you've indicated some are to do X, some are to do Y. Why these 10? In all of all of the experience, twenty five right. plus years you both have, how did these ten become the ten vital signs that made the book? I would say it's two things. I think the first thing is these all come from the work we've done with high performers, which I mentioned earlier. You know, mm -hmm. athletes, um, you know, people who are you know making their living using their body. So the same basic principles that we recommend those high performers use turns out to be the same things that Kelly and I, as two time crunched, busy working parents who spend our days in front of a computer actually found a were possible to fit into our life and B actually made us feel the best. And really we, we sort of concluded that these are the basic fundamental health behaviors that everybody needs to do. And then athletes can, you know, take those basic behaviors and continue to further optimize mm, and okay. enhance above and beyond that. But for the rest of us who just want to feel good in our bodies, be out of pain, be able to do the things we want to do physically and, and have energy to do those things. These are the basic behaviors, but they're also the basic behaviors. They're really the basic things that all high performing athletes also need to focus on. And so, you know, we have a ton of very high performing athletes who've read this book and they, you know, th they're definitely checking the box on quite a few of these things, but what they've seen is that even they, you know, people who do this for a living actually have blind spots in certain areas of this book. And, you know, simultaneously for, you know, the moms and dads that live in our neighborhood, you know, th they also are probably doing well in some areas and have blind spots in other areas. So we really just see these as like, these are the fundamental health behaviors that humans, all humans, regardless of whether you're a high-performing athlete or just a parent trying to get through the day and raise your two kids, these are the same behaviors for everybody. And, and the behaviors that we found we can actually do in that context and make us feel and perform the best in our lives. They're also mm -hmm. objective. And here's what's key is that these are data-driven, evidence-based practices supported by the research, validated by our clinical experience, 
And they're not just like sleep more. They're not just sort of pleasantries, right? They're not just platitudes. What we've given people is really clear delineations of ways that they can objectively measure these behaviors for themselves and then make choices based on their results so that they can feel the difference. And really, Juliet points out that ultimately it comes down to when and where do people have control in their lives? Because what I don't ever want to do to my busy CEO, superstar wife is give her another listicle of things she needs to check off, right? So that she can optimize. Like she will cut my throat if I do that. So <laughs> that doesn't resonate. And notice that what we also get in the bargain here is that we we move beyond I exercise or didn't exercise. That binary option is what most people think. I didn't exercise, didn't have time to exercise. It's all gone. And what we've done is expand this notion of what physical practice means so that a physical practice includes all of these things. And so if you get to the end of the day and you haven't been able to do a heroic thing, get to the gym or swing a kettlebell or breathe through the eyes, it's okay. You've actually done a ton of care and feeding and input so that when you are ready to exercise, you'll be ready. But it hasn't been a total wash. And you almost look at it, Kelly, when you say it that way is, is if you're taking care of these as the basics, you're building a solid base for your pyramid. And if we get the workout in, we're, we're going up the pyramid and, and we're refining, we're getting better, but at least cover the basics and, and get a solid base of health and mobility to, to carry you later in life. We'll also say that the, the day has come and gone where you can outwork the competition the workouts that people are doing on Instagram are very sophisticated. And, you know, we work with college teams and some of those college teams, when I talk to them, I'm like, do you really think you're outworking Stanford? Do you really think that like you're better than they are? No one is outworking anyone anymore. And so these same behaviors, as you pointed out, can serve us in that direction, but they also serve to allow us to handle higher volumes of work. And as Juliet has kind of hinted mm -hmm. at, ultimately what we're saying to people is, the durable person can actually handle greater stress. They can handle larger loads, larger stressors, more work, and still show up intact. So if we substitute the word exercise or training or sport with work stress, life stress, job stress, those things are equivalent stressors. The same sets of behaviors that allow me to recover from my 5K more effectively so I can run again, or the same sets of behaviors are going to allow me to handle a crushing business deadline or a sick family member and still be able to show up for my family. And, and something that's important there when we talk about stress and, and people listening, a lot of what we're going to talk about has to do with our body and maybe physical. But something that I found super important is you point out that this all begins with our mind and, and you both want us to think differently about how we approach our daily habits throughout this book. What does that look like for the listener who's hearing this and saying, well, wait a second, I, what do they mean it starts with their mind? Well, I think what we really want people to do is think about their environment differently. What we see in, you know, based on all those statistics you mentioned earlier that, you know, people do not have any more willpower or motivation to muster anymore. And, and we don't either, you know, we also are, you know, if we have cookies on the kitchen counter, we will eat cookies. And what we've learned over the years, you know, both individually and working with tons of athletes and owning a commercial gym and working with everyday humans, that the way to actually change, you know, change these behaviors is to change your environment and make it really easy to do the right thing and make it really difficult to do the wrong thing when it comes to your health choices. And we've done the same thing. You know, again, we, even though we are enthusiasts, we love it. We love to exercise and train. And, you know, this is what we've done. We really still, um, find ourselves, you know, falling into bad patterns if we haven't constrained our environment and made it really easy to make good decisions. And so I think that's what we really want people to think about. We want to expand people's minds to know that health, again, doesn't just happen in the one hour of the gym. And while, of course, we're fans of exercise, that's not the only place. And that there's so much people can do that happen in two minute, five minute, 10 minute increments throughout their day that can compound almost like compounding interest in finance to really make a huge difference in how people feel in their bodies. Thanks for listening. 
If you enjoy what you're hearing so far and want me to be able to get your favorite guests on this show, please do me a quick favor. Subscribe to the show and leave me a rating. The 30 seconds of your time will mean a ton to me. Let's dive into vital signs and I'd love to work through all 10 with you, but, uh, there's only so much, so much time. And so what I've done is, uh, I've borrowed from my favorite podcaster, uh, Tim Ferriss, one of your friends who likes to choose the ones that are most applicable in, uh, his life. So I have done the same. So, so the first one I'd love to start with you is you talk about the sit rise test, Kelly, you already, you, you already started to mention that one. And, and you talk about the fact that the sit rise test has a correlation with how long we're going to live. So, so what is that tie-in and what do we want someone to be thinking about it as they do this test? And depending on how they do, how can they improve in, in their if, sit if rise? If you can't get up and down off the ground, your days are numbered. No, I'm just kidding. Look, what we want, we, everyone wants to understand is, you know, how I'm, moving and living my life is somehow going to impact my future self. I think we all can wrap our heads around that. You know, we, we told people to stop smoking, not because they're going to get sick tomorrow, but something would happen in the future. And again, your ability, inability to get up and down off the test really doesn't say anything about whether or not you have pain today or what will happen to you tomorrow, but it's an indicator of how easily you can access your environment about your mm. movement choice. It probably says a lot about the kinds of behaviors around movement and some of your soft tissue behaviors that sort of reflect your day-to-day -day reality. So all I do is sit in the car and I sit in front of my computer and I sit on my couch. Well, it's not really using your joints in a, in a big way. And likely you're going to see a lot of range of motion, not a lot of activity in a person who maybe struggles with that, or they may have some real limitations, which means they don't walk. They don't begin, begin sort of engage with a cluster of other health associated behaviors. So Ultimately, this is a nice test because it's fun to do, it's free, it's easy, and you can ask your whole family about it, and we can pick up some really interesting information. You know, if you come and see me as a physical therapist for low back pain, we're going to talk about your breathing, we're going to talk about walking, and then we're also going to talk about your hip range of motion. We're going to talk about your sleep as well, but that hip range of motion gets lost in that conversation about things that I can control. So one of the things that you pointed out is what do I do about it if I struggle with this? Well, the first order of magnitude, the first order sort of off operations is exposure. So what we want you to do is start to expose yourself to the things you need to do, not now go down some rabbit hole and read some other book that takes 200 pages to get to the point. It really is, hey, let's lower yourself to the ground and try to get back up. Hey, that was challenging. Let's sit on the ground tonight during 30 minutes of TV. And what now what we Ooh. have is another behavior. So if we're trying to improve your range of motion, the shape, the first thing your brain needs to do is spend time in that position. You start to value that position. Your tissues start to adapt and remold and remodel. You start to have access to those shapes. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, it's sitting cross-legged. It's getting tiresome. So I sit 90-90. Then I long sit. Then I pull one of my legs up. And all of a sudden you've done a whole bunch of ground sitting based features and behaviors that suddenly start to restore and reprogram, rewild your hips. Lo and behold, if you do that for a week, you'll be shocked at how much better you feel and how much easier that test is. But because you're already sitting there, we're like, hey, what's that? That's the foam roller. You're already on the ground watching TV. You might as well just roll out your calves since you're already there. So now we've cl clustered another behavior there. And notice that we put that at the end of the day. We're not asking you to sit on the ground during your work day. You know, take off your skirt. You know, Be the weirdo in the office. That's not what we're proposing. What we're saying is that you probably aren't doing anything of note in the last 10 or 15 or 20 minutes of the day. You're probably watching TV because the data supports that you are. So let's go ahead and start to stack some behaviors in there and given mm -hmm. that those behaviors a chance to percolate and to really sort of, you know, marinate, you'll see that over time in a month, this thing that you really struggled with before now becomes effortless because the game here is consistency, not these heroic interventions. If I could just add a thought experiment to this as well for your listeners, uh, because you know, as we said earlier, this test predicts your longevity. And for anyone listening to this who isn't older 
they may think, okay, yeah, I'm 35. Like, why do I care? I'm not going to care now. Why should I care now at, at my age about whether or not I'm going to live a few years less long because I can't get up off and up and down off the ground? But the thought experiment I would like everybody listening to this to do is actually get out a pen and paper and actually try to set up some movement goals for your life. And let me put this into context. You know, everybody listening to this is probably saving in some way or another for retirement. And if they haven't started doing that, they know they should. And simultaneously in our personal lives and our business lives, we often set goals. We set two-year, five-year, 10-year personal and professional goals. Similarly, if we're going to run a marathon, we say, okay, in eight weeks time, I'm going to run a marathon. It's going to be on X date and I'm going to work backwards and I'm going to do the training I need to do so that I can survive running a marathon in eight weeks. These are common things we do. So what we suggest everybody do is actually do that with their own movement goals. What mm. is it that you want to do physically actually. with your body now in two years, five years, 10 years, 25 years, and 50 years? Because what I can tell you is no one's movement goal, again, like I mentioned earlier, is to be you know 85 years old bedridden in a skilled nursing facility. That is no one's movement goal. Everybody has some kind of movement goal they want to make. And so we would suggest to people, hey, look out in time in the short term, the near term, the, you know, the shorter term, longer term, and decide what it is that you want to do. Kelly and I love to ski and mountain bike. We talked about this earlier. We want to be able to ski and mountain bike when we're 80. That's one of our yes. movement goals. And so what we're doing now at 50 years old is basically training for the marathon of being able to do that when we're 80. And so I would suggest to people, I get it. Sometimes it, y there's no reason to care about some random piece of data that says we're not going to live long because we're going to fall down, but everybody has movement goals. And I suggest you write them down and start working backwards. And you know, what I can say is doing and taking care for the vital signs in this book will get people a long way towards meeting those movement goals, whatever they are, both now and in the future. And if you're an athlete today, these things will improve your performance. It's the same coin. One of the things that you, you talked about there, and, and it definitely gets in, in the way of the future is the lower back pain. And so, so I'm, I'm one of those chronic people it tends to only come out on vacation when my <laughs> wife uses one of those uh, scales yeah. to make sure she fits every <laughs> ounce into the luggage. But so I know I sit in a chair too much at work. I always forget until two or three days after the back pain, Hey, wait, usually if I stretch out my hamstrings, this pain goes away. So what is it about sitting in the chairs all day that people really have to be thinking about? And if you could each choose one mobilization for people who sit in chairs at the office to think about and to be practicing, what would you throw at them? So the first of all, three. You know, right? <laughs> first of all, sitting isn't bad and standing isn't better. Moving is best. Yes. And what we see is that, you know, you sat in a chair for a long time as a kid until it started to change how you interact with your environment. So the real question here is, how is my behavior, what are the things I'm doing every day, impacting my ability to move freely? So it's not the sitting, it's me spending a lot of time and my body adapting to this, this response. If I gave you a deep fried Twinkie every day for a year, I guarantee you we'd see some changes with that, right? And uh, the idea here is, is similar. And one of the ways that we can wrap our heads around this is this notion of something we call session cost. So a big, brutal training session or a competition, if I measure you the next day, I'm going to see decreased range of motion. I'm going to see decreased force production. You won't be very fired up. You're going to be super sore. We can actually measure that objectively with some, you know, whatever you want to do, look at your wattage, look at your poundage, look at your range of motion. But the, ultimately the session cost tells me about the impact of the behavior choice I had on my readiness today. And it's an easy way of wrapping your head around that. And I think anyone who's ever done a big effort can the next day is like, whoa, that was a big effort. That is session cost. So all of the behaviors we're engaged in, in this book are ultimately about reducing session cost so that mm. you can work harder, you can work more. But now if we just pan back, take one different lens view on of it, your chronic sitting is impacting your ability to move in your environment. The session cost of the behavior choices probably mean that 
you're going to struggle with something that looks like the couch stretch. You're going to struggle with taking a big breath in your upper back or putting your arms over your head. We know specifically because we've watched millions of people do this, that when you sit all the time, it starts to not mean automatically you're going to have back pain. It will impact your ability to express your normal physiology, to lean on that inherent native infrastructure, as you said. And so suddenly what you can see is, well, what are the set of behaviors that I need to engage with that allow me to minimize the session cost of my lifestyle? And that is super simple. So you figure out, hey, if I just mobilize my hamstrings a little bit, this Bob's your uncle, it's a piece of cake. Well, we could also start to say there are definitely some movement behaviors that help mitigate the session costs of all this prolonged sitting. Like I said, the first one I'll choose is couch stretch. What would you choose, Jay? I would also choose couch stretch. And, you know, um, thank you for Team Kelly up for that because his favorite subject <laughs> is hip extension. And we, um, no, really, it's we a, it's actually a talk about hip extension, see my hip at, extension the, tattoo? At, the din- at the dinner table. So just, you know, a little insight into what's going on in our household. But Kelly's obsessed with hip extension, but really, you know, hip extension is- That means is being in a lunge position. Being in a lunge position, but the hip extension is sort of the opposite of the way your hip is when you're sitting. So, you know, again, we always say if you want to, if you practice a position, which a lot of us are practicing sitting all day long, then you want to spend a little time doing the opposite thing. So you want to spend a little time actually practicing your hip extension. And one of the best ways we know to do that is to do something called the couch test or couch stretch. And it, it, I would just say, add it's easy to put in these isometrics during the day. Just get into a lunge position, squeeze your butt, go as deep as you can, take some breaths there. What you'll see is some of the changes in the body are structural. You become stiffer. That actually happens. That's well documented. Your body will not react. But also your brain says, hey, we're not in that position Let's not value that position. Let's let's shut our options off from that position. So, mm. you know, as Juliet's saying, you know, ultimately exposure to those shapes can help people untangle very complex phenomena. Your back hurts. Well, what do I begin to do with that? Do I, you know, start to perseverate and does it a slip disc? That's not a thing, by the way. And then we go on and on and on. I need to get an MRI. Dude, your back hurts because you haven't moved. Your hips aren't doing what they're supposed to do. You haven't taken a big breath in like three months. Suddenly we can start to apply some of these vital signs and you might make really surprising connections in your brain about why something happens. You may not even know why, but chasing the vital sign can help restore your function. And lo and behold, that's usually enough to also make you feel better. So one of the things that that I had noticed, and, and I appreciated that that was both your answers on that one, was uh, I don't mind being the quirky guy at work, Kelly. So I will <laughs> during meetings. Uh, I just get up in a meeting, you know, with a leadership team meeting. There's a dozen of us, and I just get up and I do a a couch stretch on my chair. I just lift my That's leg right. up behind Nailed me it. and stand up in the meeting and kind of listen and pay attention while stretching it out but the in Juliet you you teed this one up perfectly because I what I was going to say was I love how you wrote that asking you both what's your favorite mobilization is like asking someone to pick a favorite kid but <laughs> but then you did offer up hip mobilization so uh, it makes sense to me given the issues I've had with it over time and what I see but why is that one the one that you're so obsessed with and that our that our listeners need to be keying in on is sitting the big problem that we're countering when we're when we're working on this? I would answer that I I think it that 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 mobilization or test the couch test test is the antidote to our modern way of living which does involve a lot of sitting. What do you say? What would you say? I would say that which one of your body parts isn't important to you, but that with Juliet said that the all of the behaviors that are available to us, we end up seeing correlation between this loss of position that it's very common in sort of our modern self. So, you know, mm. ultimately we like this idea, but we could even pan back again, let's slap on a different filter on here. You know, ultimately human beings used to get up and down off the ground a lot. We used to toilet on the ground, cook on the ground, hang out on the ground, fire. We worked on the ground and that's not hyperbole. That's just a couple hundred years ago. 
Well, then there's quite a few cultures who still do that still now. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Then yeah. Um, ask, well, what did human beings do back then? And I'm not trying to pine for the Paleolithic era. I like modern conveniences like nitro cold brew coffee. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but what I'll say is we used to get up and down off the ground. We used to carry stuff around and move. We carried resources around. We carried animals and things around. Just human beings have been carrying things and getting up and down off the ground. And, and we probably did a lot of throwing. So ultimately, those basics end up being sort of the key to understanding some of our key physiologic needs. Look, you can't make the case that human beings do not need sunlight on their bodies. Like that is a, you know, vitamin D to, you know, Huberman says, set your circadian rhythm. Ultimately, what you'll start to see is even the suggestion of us trying to hit our movement minimums, right, for walking and non-exercise activity – that's not just about being fit and burning calories, although that's nice. Walking is the way that we decongest our bodies. Our lymphatic systems, which mm. are the sewage systems of the body, right? they handle between three and four liters of lymphatic fluid every day. And in that lymph are all the broken down proteins, all the old cells, kind of torn down tissues that your body's constantly remaking, remodeling. Anything that's too big to go into the circulatory system goes out through the lymphatic system. It's literally the sewage system of your body. So if you've ever seen a gross drain in standing water, that's your ankles when you have cankles when you fly on a big airplane. You, that's just sewage backing up in your ankles. But it turns out that system is bootstrapped into your movement system. So when you contract your muscles – the muscles squeeze the lymphatic system. So if you don't engage in this six to 8,000 steps a day, you actually can't move the waste through your body as effectively as if you do. And so once again, what you start to see is, oh, movement is native to the human experience. If I don't move, that is actually going against my nature. I just wanted to also mention, since we started this with you talking about how you have a prone to back pain, and, you know, it, it comes up in certain situations, but, you know, one of the ways we want, we're, we're hoping, and back to your question about the brain and how we want people to think differently. One of the ways we want people to think differently as they read this book is to really rethink the concept, uh, the concept of pain. And our view is that pain is not always a medical problem. And this is something we see day in and day out because we're the go-to people, you know, when, when, you know, our friends and neighbors and families, and we, we used to own a physical therapy clinic, right? And so we have, we've seen it all in terms of people managing pain injury. Of course, there, there is times when a medical professional is needed, but we often see that people just plain don't think about and don't have the tools to just noodle a little bit on their body and work on their range of motion and can actually make massive difference in their sort of ongoing nagging pain and injuries. And, you know, you've obviously figured out that if you stretch your hamstrings and do the couch stretch in the back of the meeting, that's going to make a huge difference in terms of your own back pain. And we really want people to start thinking that way. You know, we've struggled over the years with working with people who don't actually care to do some care and feeding of their body until they get injured. And then, you know, they of course mm. become evangelists of doing it. But what we want people to think about is that pain and, you know, is not always a medical problem and you don't always have to go see six doctors and get 27 pictures in order to just actually put a little bit of input into your body while you're watching Netflix in front of your couch, you know, at home on a weeknight. I'd go further and say pain is a request for change. And in our athletic communities, nice. if I dropped into someone's brain in the middle of a competition, I would perish from the discomfort. It would be so – Juliet is a – was a state champion rower and rower at Cal. So if I dropped into the middle of a 2K and just experienced the hate that was circulating in her body, I would literally be like, this is hell, I'm perishing, I'm out. So we want people to understand that this discomfort, while highly subjective, and of course it's okay to talk to your physician, what we also want people to know is that you know you have a lot of agency and control over these systems. In our athletic populations, we use pain as another diagnostic tool, just like loss of performance. Oh, I see that you sucked on the bike today. What's that about? Well, I smashed three liters of beer with my friends last night, and I ate 16 pizzas, and I didn't sleep. And we're like, oh, no wonder you sucked on the bike today, right? That loss of performance, why does your knee hurt? I haven't slept. I'm highly stressed. I haven't moved. 
I haven't fueled. Suddenly we have a whole lot of things in agency where I can feed back. We haven't even talked about you. Do you have full range of motion or not? So one of the things we're trying to do in this book is also give people a counter narrative where they can engage in very safe, very actionable behavior in their home to make themselves feel better. And that is a total disservice that we've told everyone, pain is above your pay grade. What a bunch of horse crap that is. And what we did was we inadvertently sent people out to go find bourbon, THC, ibuprofen, Adderall, you know, anything that made themselves feel better, they engaged with except for the basics. Walking. Yeah, and, walking. And, and, and we're gonna we're gonna go to that one next because it actually I mean, we, does call, like um, solve a lot of our problems. It, Seriously. It probably does. You know, we if you aren't sleeping, you aren't going to change your body composition, you're not going to gain muscle. You're not going to have good looking skin. You're not going to learn learn a new skill. Your body isn't going to grow if you're a teenager. You're going to struggle to recover from injury or surgery. You're going to have a hard time with chronic persistent pain. So it seems to me that the magic number here is eight hours of sleep, not seven hours of sleep, eight hours of sleep, eight and above things start to change. But so much, so many times we're presented with dirty data. To the point where Juliet and I were like, we don't believe you. Can you show us your sleep tracker? We just don't think that this is a, like, you don't have a running problem. You have an environment problem. So when we begin to sort out and re-regulate base function for people, lo and behold, their brain stop being as twitchy. Their tissues stop being so dramatic. And they can handle higher loads and feel better. But also, you still need your range of motion. So we can talk about both sides simultaneously, top down, bottom up. In, in the, we're going to tackle both of those because they're so fundamental. The the other thing I, I don't want to forget because you, you talked about pain and, and I thought it was really important. To, not enough people think about the idea of the upstream downstream. And I, I've probably had Achilles issues for the last dozen years, let's say, since I, I first started Ironman training. Every physiotherapist I've ever been to it said, no, you don't have Achilles issues. Like you have weak glutes and it's manifesting in your Achilles. So how does this concept of upstream downstream and, and Hey, the pain's telling a story, but it's not necessarily what you think. It could be somewhere else in your body that's broken down. And when we fix that, we're going to fix the, the chain, if you will. Well, I would just like to say that if people take nothing from this entire podcast, this upstream and downstream concept is really significant. I mean, the amount of, you know, pain and, you know, ongoing nagging issues we've been able to help people resolve on their living room floors on their own with the sort of understanding the upstream downstream idea. And wait, wait, let's, let's explain this. Are you saying that if my quads are stiff or I have trigger points, my knee can hurt? Oh, yes, that's true. Are I you can. saying that if my hamstrings are stiff, my knee can hurt? Yes. Those are upstream, right? Yes. What's downstream of my knee? Your calves. Weird. So you're saying if I have tight, restricted calves, it could cause knee pain? Yes. Okay, there you go, people. You don't even need to know the name of the muscles. You just go above and below the thing that hurts. But, you know, the, the human body is one of the most complex things in the known universe. And everything, it turns out that it's also a system and that everything is connected. And so, you know, especially when people are dealing with joint pain, you know, the first order of business is to say, okay, my hip is bothering me or my knees bothering me. Let's take a look at upstream and downstream. And fortunately, the things that you can do to sort of, you know, work upstream and downstream are actually really safe. So, you know, you can roll your quads or roll your calves on a foam roller or a ball, or you can do some basic hip mobilizations. And these things are really safe to do and can really make a big difference in, in that pain. And it's so simple. And let me give you a rationale for your calf. Ready? You already told me what happened. So you're saying I have this a problem in my Achilles. You've tried 17 different shoes, but that didn't solve the problem. <laughs> you tried a different goo gel, that didn't solve the problem. You, you explained to your family you need a new tri bike, and that didn't solve the problem. <laughs> so it turns out one of the things you said was, hey, I have to engage in a certain behavior that's sitting a lot. And sometimes I, it doesn't feel very good. And then someone also said, hey, I have weak glutes or there's nothing weak about your body. Let's be clear. But one of the things that happens is if you aren't effective at, wait for it, extending your hip or if you don't have <laughs> hip extension access, you know what gets inhibited in that you system. You see what I mean, Clint? You see what, what I mean? What gets it inhibited in that system? It's, it's, your you know glutes. What, it doesn't matter what Check this out. If is. you get into the couch stretch and if you can't squeeze your butt like it's your job, that is the problem. And what ends up happening is your hamstrings <laughs> end up you doing the job of your glutes 
and to flex the lower leg. And so you have this overstressed hamstring, which changes the tension and fascia in your calf and wait for it, changes your entire stride. Why? Because you're overstriding because you can't put your leg out behind you. And then because you can't put your leg out behind you, wait for it, people, you end up turning your leg out and then striking with an open position. So you're not even, foot isn't even straight anymore, it contacts the ground. All because you didn't do the couch stretch. I mean, he's not wrong You're because welcome. I, I have two <laughs> mobility apps on my phone and then I do the human, I'm like, oh, this is bothering me. And so then when I'm doing my workouts, I've got a home gym right behind us here. Awesome. And when I'm, when I'm doing my workouts, I'll often do the mobility exercises between sets yes. as my, as, as my yes, rest. Yes, this is the way. Right? And, and, and when I'm doing that, I'll, it tells me, hey, your problem area is largely your your hips. And so it's a lot of lunging. It's a lot of pigeon. And when I'm doing it consistently, never even notice my Achilles. And what do I do? Because I don't notice the Achilles pain, I stop doing the mobility. Because I'm like, okay. yeah, problem solved. <laughs> based yeah. on your anthropometry, based on your history, like it's okay. It's That is a reasonable thing. What is an unreasonable thing is to just wait around or stop doing the thing you love, hoping that it just gets better on its own. That's just magical yes. thinking. Instead, you're like, oh, I know the three or four things that I do for a couple of days to banish this. And then I'm ahead of it. And then I go on with the rest of my life. That is a reasonable thing to give people solutions and say, hey, lean into this so that now you're on your run. You're like, oh, my Achilles is barking. I know what I need to do. I'm behind. That becomes a lagging indicator for your body and one that you can quickly identify that's called pattern recognition that is the whole game the whole game is for us to know ourselves through sport but to un identify that discomfort or that stiffness or that tightness as our own individual metric of how we're doing and that that you know what to do to banish that or make it feel better or attenuate it that is really what we're trying to do here for people you also mm. pointed out something that I think is so important and we've been trying to emphasize in this book and hope we did a good job is that you just figured out a time in your life That's right. where you could sneak in Preach, mobility work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are fans of doing it, as we've mentioned before, in front of the TV and sitting on the floor in front of our couch, you know, because we like to chill in front of the TV at night. We know a lot of people do. That works for us and for our lifestyle. But, you know, our view is... Nobody listening to this needs to go out and take a one hour mobility class and, and tack that on, on top of the other things they're busy doing and the training they're trying to do. You've just got to figure out ways to sneak it in. You can really make a huge difference in these little one, two, five, ten minute, you know, moments where you just spend a little time paying attention to your body, putting some input into the body that, you know, we need to be able to use now and into the future. I would say this is just why, you know, Yoga is not a perfect solution. I have to go do an hour, go to an hour yoga class How many, or get a massage. How often are you going to do that? We want to be hyper local. We want to respect people's time and understand hey, we trust that you'll figure out where to put this in instead of creating this sort of, you know, the artifice of if I go do this other thing, you know, it's like saying, oh, my calves are tight. Let me go to a spin class for an hour and I hope that magically solves it. That's crazy. That's exactly what we're doing when we go to yoga. I'm not going to pick on the yoga people because they may uh, have a revolt. But I, I, I oh, understand no, no, no. what, you're, I understand what down, you're saying on that we one. We are super <laughs> down with yoga. No, we love yoga, but we're just saying, you know, if you're someone who likes to train in different ways besides yoga. Yeah, you can and, add you, you know, it. It's, yeah, yeah, you've been told by people, okay, well, you've got to stretch and work on your flexibility. And you're like, okay, great, but I can't go to that class on top of my triathlon training or whatever else. But I if yoga is a movement practice, come yeah. pretty great movement practice. It's like me saying to you, Oh, your knee hurts. Go to CrossFit. Like you're going to use the, your range of motion, right? We're going to get in there. It's just, it, it's a, it's a poor argument. However, mm -hmm. we should look at this book and I'll suggest that you should look at yoga as a third party validation of your current training system. So if you have the secret scroll program, then you're going to ace all of these. You'll get 10 out of 10 on everything. If you're, if you're crushing it, if you go to a yoga class and you're having a hard time getting into downward dog, you're having a hard time standing one leg, holy crap, yoga should be easy. You're not going to be the best yogi in the class, but you should be competent at yogi if the things you're doing are maintaining your range of motion. I think that's what's so crucial. 
yoga doesn't ask us to have a supernatural range of motion. So when people go to yoga and get their butt kicked, we're like, dude, what have you been doing with yourself? <laughs> yoga is just native range of motion, but done slowly with some breathing, like pump the brakes. If you're getting your ass kicked in yoga, maybe it's the Peloton that's not serving you as well as you think. And I think this just goes back to the point I was making earlier, though, about this sort of fallacy of the one hour class. I mean, most people we know at the most have one hour where they can eat and they have to choose. They can either exercise or go to yoga or do something. Most people can figure out a way in a time crunch life to have this sort of one hour block where they can get something done. Um, but what we find is, you know, people either choose that they're going to go to CrossFit six times or they're only going to go to yoga. But most people don't have time to both have a, you know, a really deep training program where they're getting some cardio and lifting weights and doing yoga because most people don't have a two full hours to dedicate into their day. And so that's one of the reasons we have and continue to love a mobility practice, just like the one you're talking about, because you really can actually make some significant difference in your body in these little ways. I mean, you know, seriously, you're doing a mobility practice by doing the couch stretch while you're at, at a meeting, you know, with your staff. And let me blow your mind for a second. Imagine you went to yoga and you got into a position and you struggled with it and then you mobilized and you came back and used that position. That's actually how some of the best yogis work. What do you think Iyengar was doing with all those blocks and straps? He wasn't messing around. He was saying, you can't even get into the shape. We better figure out ways to get you into the shape and modify the shape. Here's a block. Here's a strap. So, you know, ultimately what you're doing is the same thing as going to a yoga class, struggling with downward dog, mobilizing your hamstrings, and then getting downward dog and being crushing at it. That's what we want to do. Well, even, even, even yoga. I mean, if we, if we take a step back, the, the yogis, first started doing yoga because they wanted people to meditate and they realized, well, Hey, you can't get in the positions to maintain right. your meditation long enough for it to be effective. So we have to, we have to mobilize your body in these ways so that we can get you to sit in a Lotus or, or whatever have you, they had them do for Gosh, An knows hour, how long, you know, five hours <laughs> for the yogis, probably the entire day, but, uh, like a Vipassana 10 hour sit, but they're, they're saying, Hey, we need to mobilize you so you can do that sit. So, I mean, we're going way back and, and they're doing mobilizations way back then, but let's shift direction to a new vital <laughs> sign. So on, on this one, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a long question and, and then just l let you run with it. Uh, I'll digress a little bit. You talked about two, five, 10 year plans. My wife and I were starting to map out where home base is going to be when the kids are out of school. And I've pivoted away from working full time to a, a bit of a different life that we've mapped out. And every city we, we seem to try, especially in the U.S., lacks walkability. <laughs> which, which is a major thing for us. We want to get outside our door and walk the city, walk our neighborhood. And, and we do see it a fair amount in, in Europe. And one of the things you guys talked about that I found uh, pretty crazy was taking more 4,000 steps per day. If we establish that as our baseline, if we take 8,000, it decreases our risk of death from all causes by 51%. If we take 12,000, it decreases it by 65%. Right. And, and then you pointed out that societies like Japan and Australia, I think it was 11,000 and 9,000 on average for those two cities, they have a lot lower obesity than we do in the US. Now, maybe maybe other things other than just the walking. But why Why is that walking so important? And, and why in North America are we so low on our walking? And how can, we, how can we get more of that into our lives? Well, this is our favorite subject because we are evangelists of walking and we're trying to make walking sexy on the internet, which is, is challenging, but we are huge fans of it. But I'll start with the obesity point you made. You know, walking is what's known as technically as non-exercise activity. You know, scientists call it neat or non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's just all of the movement we get in our day that's sort of outside of formal exercise. So it could be walking, gardening, cooking, you know, any kind of my, my micro movement, even fidgeting while you're standing at a desk or working, even that counts as non-exercise activity. But what the research is starting to show is that 
that it's actually not the formal exercise, but it's the amount of non-exercise activity we're getting that can actually make the biggest difference over our lifetime in whether or not we struggle with our weight. And so, you know, I think that's what we mentioned earlier. I mentioned earlier talking about the other 23 hours of the day. Again, huge fans of exercise. We think people should be doing it. I think, you know, unless people are under a rock, they know they should be, and they know the reasons they should for cardiovascular health and strength and agility and all those other things. But again, because we've told people that they have checked the box of health, if they exercise for one hour a day, we find people are just plain not moving at all for the other 23 hours a day. And it, and that really could be the difference between, you know, having a life where you struggle with your weight and a life where you don't. And, you know, there's some other really epic things that we love about walking. And one of those is human connection. And, you know, we found, for example, that we have a 20 minute walk to the end of our block and back. We do it almost every night. It's one of the ways that we can connect with one another and sort of check in and see how our day was and what's working and what's not working. We don't take our phones. You know, we actually have occasion to interact with our neighbors. So we, you know, Blaspheme. Blaspheme. We get to know our community. We connect with one another. You know, we love to walk and hike in our neighborhood. And so we spend a lot of time doing that. And it's just one of the ways that we can really connect with people outside of technology. You know, we're also huge fans of rucking. You know, Kelly mentioned that, you know, human beings are designed to carry load and that it's something that we used to do. You know, we're always carrying resources. So we often put on heavy backpack and walk around that way. But, you know, there, and, and then just to continue to add things, Kelly talked a bit about the lymphatic system. So for anyone who's listening to this, who likes to train and exercise, walking is the best way to recover from whatever athletic activity you're doing. You know, whether it's triathlon training or CrossFit or you name it, you know, if you want to avoid getting cankles and really get the sewage out of your body, the best way to do that is walking. And I'll let Kelly talk a little bit about how we fit it into our lives. Yeah. Ultimately the, I think where we get wrong is if I say, hey, you need 10,000 steps because some Japanese pedometer said that that was the magic auspicious number. It seems overwhelming versus, hey, what does this sort of consistent move, movement look like? So Juliet and I are talking to you from a standing desk. We're both perching right now, which means we're leaning against the stool, but we have our both feet on the ground. So we're not really sitting. That's another example of moving right? It doesn't really necessarily count towards steps, but the idea is but still non-exercise non activity. Exercise activity. Yeah. And so the step is really the allegory for where in my life can I get more movement in? And that may be perching for a little while. That may be, you know, choosing to walk a little bit differently. It may be just choosing to make these sort of, Hey, I'm just going to commit to a 10 minute walk after every meal in my day. I'm going to see if I can take this meeting walking. I'm going to see if I can walk to the corner grocery store. And suddenly what you see is that it all aggregates and notice that in the mm. book, we really shoot for that 8,000 steps. And we think if you're getting the best benefits from you know, the, the lion's share of 50% of the, you know, reduction in all cause mortality from walking six, 8,000 steps. That's a number that actually most people can wrap their heads around. But we also want people to appreciate that we are very keen on being able to scale up and scale down and scaling up in this situation is actually one of the ways that we found that one of our, the elite military groups we work with in the army solved health related sleep problems with their warfighters. They started prescribing 15,000 steps. And it turned out a lot of those warfighters actually accumulated enough non-exercise activity fatigue, sleep pressure that they actually fell asleep. So your mileage may vary. And more importantly, it's really looking at the trend in the average. It's not that I walked 20,000 steps yeah. this weekend and then I didn't, I was inactive. We noticed that when we put trackers on our kids in elementary school, on rainy days, they walked between two and 3,000 steps. So all the behaviors that we're talking about here, think about them for your own health, then say, do my children eat enough fruits and vegetables? Do my children walk and move their bodies? Do my children get the minimum eight hours of sleep required for a growing body? And what you're going to be shocked at is that all of these behaviors can scale backwards through time and upwards through time. So we're not just trying to solve fall risk in the elderly here. We're trying to help put inputs for our children that will kind of ride for decades and decades and decades for compounding interest. So mm. I would also say that back to my ongoing point that everything doesn't need to be done in an hour. It is 
totally doable to accumulate 8,000 steps for most people in five, 10 minute increments, just with a little bit of intention and with, you know, thinking about your environment differently. You know, this is just deciding you're going to park farther away. Or, you know, if you have a meeting that doesn't require you to be on video, but on Zoom, put in your headphones and take a walking meeting. You know, we, we've measured that 20 minute walk in our neighborhood that we take at night. It's 1,750 steps. And so there's little teeny ways that you can actually, you, you actually can accumulate 8,000 steps pretty reasonably in a day with just a little bit of thought and, and intention toward it. And, you know, so we really think it's doable and that's why we like the 8,000 step number, you know, 10,000 steps for some reason feels unattainable to people. And they often resort to the, well, I can't do it. So I'm not going to do anything mentality. And, you know, again, there's no point in my days, except for maybe on weekends, if I'm actively going for a hike, there's no point where I'm like, okay, I'm going out now to go for a walk and I'm going to walk for an hour. I'm able to accumulate those steps, you know, doing some of it, just my normal daily activities of cooking and taking care my kids and, you know, doing whatever I'm doing around my house. And then the rest of it, just with these light intentions throughout the day in five, 10, 20 minute blocks. Something you mentioned, you know, as you're looking at where you want to settle, you know, if we look at the blue zones, these places where people are living to be a long age, ultimately they aren't in an environment where they're going to the gym. <laughs> they're not doing, they're not driving somewhere and then going to a walking class all of their movement and all these behaviors are built into how they yeah. live day to day. So again, as Julia has pointed out, this isn't one more decision. You just have to walk to the grocery store because that's how you get to the grocery store. You have to eat more fruits and vegetables because that's what you have accessible. You end up having better social interactions because you live in a neighborhood where people walk. And so you can start to see how all of these things integrate. Look, one of the Best pro tips, if you're listening to this, you're still listening to this, and you um, you know, work in a high-performance situation, it is a competitive advantage to sit down and eat with your teammates at least once a week. We see that the best athletes on the planet and the best teams on the planet share at least one meal a day, and actually a lot of them share two or three meals a day. And it turns out, well, that's hmm. – well, I didn't think about the insulin benefits of just eating with people, but it, one of the reasons that – we are a society is that we connect over food. And so, you know, what we suddenly realize is one of the reasons we're so expansive and so sort of food positive around fruits and vegetables and proteins is that it means that you don't have to have some strange eating behavior every night for your weird three almond mom diet. You get to go ahead and hang out with your kids and eat fruits and vegetables and meats and proteins. Do the same thing with your, with your work group. And you'll see that Again, all of these things really integrate into making us a, a systematic whole. And, you know, I think you're right about the, you know, find it, excuse me, I think you're right about the fact that it is difficult to find, you know, cities in the U.S. that are ultimately very walkable. And one story for you, Kelly actually grew up in Europe, in southern Germany, and we have traveled there quite a bit with our kids and are lucky enough to have been there. But one thing that happens to me when I go there is I typically I'm a bit off the rails from a dietary standpoint. You know, I drink, I don't really drink beer at home, but when I'm in Germany, I drink beer and I tend to eat a lot of brown food. And, you know, we've traveled in Italy and I had pizza for breakfast and gelato for lunch. And, you know, I, I definitely am not as conscientious about my diet when I'm on vacation and traveling in Europe. But the the thing I notice is I actually come back and I usually have actually lost two or three pounds. And the difference there, again, I'm not exercising because I'm on vacation. I'm not going to the gym, but I'm just moving a lot throughout my day. You're walking 20,000 steps. 20, 25,000 yeah, steps yeah, because yeah. the cities and the environment are set up for that. You know, and one of the things I'll tell you is we used to live in the city of San Francisco and we now live in a suburb. And one really important thing to us when we moved is we actually wanted to have a store within walking distance of our house. And it was a big factor and where we chose our own house because after living in a walkable city like San Francisco, we didn't want to find ourselves in the suburbs having to get in the car every time we wanted a gallon of milk. And, it, and just that little detail alone has made a huge difference in how much we move. Well, Juliet, I couldn't help but uh, while you were talking earlier, I was thinking every time I've been to Europe with my wife, exactly what you say. I, I eat way more food than I do here. You go for tasting menus at, at a nice restaurant. And every time I come home, I expect to stand on the scale and be up five plus pounds. And I'm usually down five. And, yeah. and my, my wife <laughs> loves to walk like 
to Kelly, you, like 20,000 steps, not outside the ordinary, you know, 15 to 20 kilometers a day, walking tours mixed with like, we've never rented a car when we've been to Europe or Asia. In Love it. every trip I've gone down to the US, we've, it's the first thing we have to do, get to the <laughs> airport, get a car and, and, and drive to the location. The, the other thing that jumped out at me there, and I, I know it's not from the book, but Kelly, when you mention the sports and the meals together, when I think about, I, I coach my youngest son in hockey, and whenever you have that first out of city tournament where you go away, you play four or five games over the weekend, the kid's best memory of the trip is A, the pool in the hotel, and, and, and the, the, the mini hockey in the, in the amenities room. But you come back from that tournament and at every team I've, I've been with, you come back and the team that comes home is completely different than the team that went on the road trip. If I want to replicate that, not only do that with the tournament, but try to get my team together for a meal one, once a week together to say, hey, we're going to have a meal. We're going to talk about, talk about the upcoming week, what's going on, and just have some fun together. Well, how about this? It's an experiment. We know what best practice looks like. We have the data and the experience, even if it's a subjective, empirical you know, experience. It's anecdotal, but it's serial anecdotalism. So we have thousands of data points. We know that human beings have been eating food together. It's probably research on it somewhere. But what I would say is go ahead and test it. See how it feels for your own body. You know, the, what's amazing about this book is with vital signs, you might find that you had a significant change in the culture and how you all related just by a single meal. You have it on a weekend, but then we start to say, well, what's the minimum dose here? Is it practicable for yeah. me to have, do I have to have three meals a week with my, with my team? That's not going to happen. But what you'll si find is the human brain is only a brain if it's around other brains, period. And so many of the behaviors we're talking about are about maintaining your independence and maintaining your ability to go interact with other people and play with other people, interact and maintain your, your independence so you can hang out with your family. I have spent enough time in hospitals to see people get sick or fracture a hip where I came home and was like, Juliet, we're not doing that because the world gets very, very small and people get very lonely. What happened in when we ran the COVID experiment oh, in – you know, in what we saw, we isolated people and we saw depression go through the roof. And it turned out looking at a screen was not the same thing as being with another human being. Yeah. So, you know, Juliet and I are backing in to some of these essential behaviors around creating a civil society, but it's all done under the guise of things like eat food. Let's go ahead and walk and say hi to your neighbors. Let's get some sun on your body. Let's, I mean, these are the things that we think are most important, but we're not going to lead with them. We see them as ancillary benefits. Let's jump to that one right there that you said, because we talked about food. So we already talked earlier mm -hmm. uh, about obesity and challenges we're seeing there. And, and what I loved about how you approach food was not to say, here's what not to eat or here's what diet <laughs> yeah. to do. It was, hey, eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, here's an 800 gram challenge. And eat more protein. And here's a rough guideline for how much protein to eat. C can you share with the listeners, what, do, what is this 800 gram challenge and, and what's the protein boost? Like what are, what are some of the things you want them to add to their diet? Yeah. And thank you for picking up on that. I think, you know, that, that is one of the things we love about this style of eating is that it's, it, and for us and for many people who will experience this, it's the first time in their life, a so-called diet actually feels expansive and not restrictive. You know, Kelly and I have been in the fitness business for so long. And before that, you know, I was following the fat-free diet and, you know, we've done it all. We've done paleo and, and the zone and, you know, you name it, we've, we've tried it all, experienced it all. And, you know, in every single we case, are survivors. we're survivors. <laughs> Diet wars. Yeah, the diet wars. And, and, you know, in every single case, there was something that was restricted. And so what we love about the 800 gram challenge, and I want to give credit where credit was due is it was developed by our friend EC Sinkowski of a company called Optimize Me Nutrition. And, you know, she based the 800 grams on a study that showed that, you know, that is the base number you need to really get all the benefits of the micronutrients and the fiber and fruits and vegetables. And the other key thing that I think is so critical in, in you know, in, again, as, as being 
survivors of the diet wars is that, you know, we told people a lot of really stupid things that like bananas and fruit were bad for you and that that was sugar and that you shouldn't eat those things. And, you know, that's, that's to my mind, really one of the biggest disservices we did to people in this sort of restricted diet food. is to demonize certain foods. I mean, demonize really any food, but especially demonize something like a banana or fruit. You know, the way the 800 gram challenge is, the way it works is that, you know, we challenge people to eat 800 grams of fruits or vegetables in, in a day. And that can be any fruits or vegetables. Look for like medium to large size apples is 800 grams. So if you want to eat four apples in a day, knock yourself out, like go for it. You know, the thing Kelly, likes to point out is an entire pound of cherries is 230 calories. So, you know, fruit is not the reason that we're struggling with obesity as a larger community. That's not the problem. And again, going back to, you know, what you, what we were talking about earlier with community, I mean, food is the way that we commune as humans. And I think one of the challenges with all of these diets that have come out again, being so restrictive is that it's made people weird and not be able to eat and not be able to go out with no, their I'm friends. I'm going to bring my dinner. chicken breast in this bag. Yeah. They're going to bring oh. their own, their own little bag of rice in a Ziploc bag to their dinner out with their friends, right? Like we've done a lot of weird things. And if you act weird around food, it disconnects you from your community. Right. And so again, it's like, it's or it like, doesn't respect your cultural yeah. heritage, you the way your family eats. You, look, it's, it's bananas. So, so one of my big influences is Kate Shanahan, who wrote this book that I love called Deep Nutrition. And she studied food culture around the world. And turns out that every single culture does the exact same things with food. You know, people eat meat on the bone. They eat a vast amount of, of a very big variety of fruits and vegetables. They eat a fermented food. Now, how they prepare those foods differ culture by culture, but everybody eats the same things. And turns out that, again, back to this basics idea, this is the way humans need to eat. And one of the great things about the 800 gram challenge is it totally respects your cultural preferences. You know, if you want to eat kimchi or beans or beans or white potatoes, because that's what your culture's into. All those things are fair game. And you can also, you know, if you are, you know, if, if you are keto or paleo or vegan or vegetarian, you name it, vegetables are still, vegetables and fruit are still part of all of those diets and you can choose to eat which ones of them, you know, we just suggest you eat 800 grams. And so just going back to what you said at the beginning, it's just been for us as individuals, as sort of refugees of diet culture, it's been so lovely to have this style of eating that feels expansive, that allows us to be connected to our community, that allows us to sit and have dinner with our kids every night and be normal and not weirdos. And, you know, and on top of that, we just feel better when we eat that many fruits and vegetables. One of the things that we're doing here is there is calorie control built into this. You know, as Juliet yes. pointed out, a, a melon it's like over a pound and it's like 250 calories. I mean, that, that's not even a cookie at Starbucks. I mean, so, you know, like that's not even a large latte. Melon. So what you're going to see here is when we ask people to increase their micronutrient intake, they end up being having high satiety. They feel good. They have more fiber. I mean, show me a study where fiber doesn't improve someone's life. On the other side, though, we also want to make sure that people are getting enough protein, which again has high satiety. Do we say what kind of protein? Do you have to eat only ribeye? No, you don't. So what we know is that oftentimes when people are struggling with, and this is, look how we got to this or how I got to this. I didn't want to even touch nutrition because I thought it was like third yeah. rail, it's not my jam. But I'm not going to talk about the health of your tissue quality or your healing or your ability to maintain your muscle mass unless you hit specific protein amounts per. So we are really reasonable. We're actually like 0.7 to 1 gram of protein per pound body weight depending on your activity and your age. If you're older, you need closer to a gram of protein per pound body weight. And what people are going to struggle with is, Oh my gosh, how do I eat all this food? Which is what no one on a diet ever said ever. Oh my God, I have to eat all this food again. This is terrible. And tomorrow I'm going to have to eat this more food. But if we're going to get to the bottom of you having healthy, badass tissues that are resilient, you need micronutrients, you need protein, and you need fiber, period. And, and that's and, what makes it durable human. And one of the key things in, in I'm, slight digression, I, I'm a survivor like you guys, <laughs> and it sucks that my my friends will say, "Hey, uh, dinner party! Like, what what weird diet That's are right. you are you on now?" And I like to, uh, no, 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 I'm back to normal. The but but you 
when you when you talked about the protein, one of the things I hadn't heard a long time ago, but I'm hearing it more and more, and you talked about it, is this idea of that we can only absorb so much in one sitting. So so we're going for a like I'm getting older. I want a gram per pound of body weight. Two things: a gram per pound of target body weight because because the target weight's lower than the current weight. And <laughs> the second question is. I'm only supposed to eat, I think you said, somewhere in the 50 to 60 grams per sitting. Is there, what's the upward limit on that per sitting? Race that from your head. Okay. Look, if, if you can only eat, you eat one meal a day, because that's when you get to do it, do it. Get it all. Okay. But ultimately, the research supports that spreading that protein out is probably better for your lean body mass and how you feel. You know, we're seeing this whole Ozempic sort of, you wasteland go through the United States right now where people are taking Ozempic. And the real problem is that people are losing most of the weight is, is lean muscle mass. And that actually doesn't have to be the case. They're just not eating. And when they eat a little bit, they get full. And so what we're seeing is that, wow, if you turn that down or fill it up with other things, it's going to be really difficult. Ultimately, what we want people to do is really prioritize these base things. What you just did is hijack the conversation. Is it 50? Is it 52 grams? Is it 54 grams? Show me in a week that you actually hit your number of grams consistently for a week. And then we can have a conversation about is it 51 grams or 52 grams? Because what we see consistently is that everyone under eats their protein. They don't recover and they're wondering why they're not making gains. Why is their splits time sucking? Why do their tissues suck? When we just get you above that first, and notice we said you could do it with beans, you could do it with tofu, you could do it with seitan, you could eat any way you want, but show me you're going to get to this level. And that is research supported. So ultimately, if you eat a 60 gram protein bolus, you're probably going to be full, especially when you put a bunch of fruits and veggies, it's probably going to be easier to spread that out. We played around with time-restricted eating for a while. And one of the problems with time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting for me was that I missed a huge feeding window. And so that by the time the afternoon came around, I was like, holy crap, I'm going to suck on the bike today because I'm underfed. And I was. And then I ended up eating like a whole chicken and a jar of peanut butter like 11 o'clock at night. And that is not a recipe for a great night's sleep, let me tell you. So ultimately, I ditched time-restricted eating because it made it really difficult for me to get enough protein and enough fruits and vegetables in my day. One of the things we like about this approach too, as Kelly mentioned, is it really is a lot of food. And so it's, you know, it's a high satiety way of eating. But, you know, we also live in a universe where like cookies are awesome. And, you know, people have celebrations and they involve dessert and fun things. And like, you know, my, my food kryptonite is popcorn. And it turns out though, that you can actually buffer some poor choices if you have walked enough and got enough movement in your life and gotten a little bit of exercise and eaten, you know, plenty of fruits and vegetables. And, and so, you know, there is a way to sort of actually occasionally eat some things that are fun, you know, back to like eating is fun as a human. It's one of the fun things we do. It's actually, you can create an environment where you can eat some things that are fun as long as you're getting tons of movement in your day and you're making sure that the vast majority of your calories are coming from fruits and vegetables and protein. Let me give you an example. One of our friends, Ryan Fisher has this great idea. He's like, get one of those mixed berry bags that's in the frozen section from Walmart or wherever you want to eat it. If you can afford organic berries, do it. It's fine. And he's like, pull it out of the freezer and then just put it in your fridge. And when you are ready to like have your dinner and you're ready to snap, your sweet tooth is kicking up, he's like, eat a pound of fruit. Just go for it. The thing kind of creates a soft, mushy mess. Dude, we're talking about 250 calories here of micronutrients and you're mm. going to be stuffed. And I guarantee you can't actually finish the whole bag because you're a wimp. I challenge you to eat the whole bag of frozen fruit when it's all smushy and you're going to be like, I can't do it. It's too much. And then we can really get to the conversation. You know, people, when we said it before, we're trying to get people to be consistent before the heroic. We see a lot of heroic behaviors that end up falling off because they're not sustainable. The yeah. game here is how do I make these changes in my life in a meaningful way so it doesn't feel like a fad or a gimmick? Then you can just turn up those dials and turn down those dials as you need. And Kelly and I, you know, our strategy and what has worked for us and, and why we wrote this book is that what we found is doing these basics, these 10 things consistently has made the biggest difference. It gives us room to be able to eat a cookie every so often and, you know, have fun eating with our kids and travel and, you know, 
feel good in our bodies. Like these basic things have been very expansive. The, uh, I love that. And so I, I won't, uh, I won't worry about the minor details till I get the, uh, <laughs> the macro for us for the trees. The, so uh, the question I want to end on from the book to make sure that we get it in, because you, you already said sleep is the linchpin, uh, in, in a quote that you have, it's, it's the hub that everything revolves around aside from the innumerable ways that sufficient sleep sustains the body from cardiovascular health and cognitive function to how we experience pain. It also gives you the energy to follow all the recommendations that we talked about and that the two of you share in the book. If you're sleeping well, you'll not only be more apt to perform the nine other vital sign physical practices, you'll get more out of them too. So for sleep, how do you want the listener to test that? And what does good look like? And, and what would you what would you two say your top two or three things that each of you have for sleep are? And then I really want to know, Juliet, where do I get a weighted thermal regulating blanket? Because yes. that, that sounded well, like money. I'll just say what our minimums are. You know, we think seven hours is sort of the minimum. That's a survival number. How long do I need to be in bed to get seven hours of sleep? You need to be in bed for eight hours to get seven hours of sleep. And, but we found that again, like Kelly mentioned, eight hours is the magic number. You know, if you want to, how long weight, do I need to be in bed to be, get eight hours of sleep? Nine hours. And, you know, if you want to lose weight, recover from surgery, get over an injury, you know, address pain. I mean, you name it. If you, if you want to feel good, eight hours is really the magic number. Now I will say, because someone on this is listening to this, there is a weird genetic mutation that like 0.02% of people have that they, those people don't, can you don't survive have you on don't have five it. hours of sleep a night. And no one listening to this has that genetic mutation. It's not true. Everybody needs seven to eight hours of sleep a night. And look, again, I want to go back to this idea. And if you're a triathlon, tri triathlon person? Nine hours. Yeah, or it's nine or ten. Uh, Kelly and I live a very full life and we often have to travel for work. We love to travel for fun. So we do have nights where we don't make it. But again, back to this consistency idea, we're looking at the ha making sure we get that amount of sleep as many times as we can in any calendar year and compound that amount of sleep. And so, you know, we've got to go to Dallas this week. We're probably going to have at least one night where we sleep only five hours, but we don't just give up on that and say, okay, this is our new reality. We just say, okay, this is, this is our reality for now. And then when we get home, we need to get back on our game and get back to eight hours of sleep. And you know, what Kelly was asking me earlier is really important. We're not huge fans of tracking that much data. Um, we do track a few things. I think the most important thing people can track is their steps. And pretty much everybody can do that now because your phone has a step tracker built into it. And so if you have your phone with you, you're tracking your steps and, and, you know, most watches, including the Apple watch and a lot of watches people are wearing now track steps. But I think the second thing, and I, I don't think you have to track it all the time, but I do think it's really helpful to get some basic sleep information. Um, Kelly and I like an aura ring. There's lots of ways you can track your sleep. The biggest thing we learned from tracking our sleep is exactly what we were talking about earlier, which is it's natural for pretty much everyone to lose almost an hour of sleep with what are totally normal wake cycles in a night. And so, you know, we've had so many people approach us and be like, I go to sleep at 11, wake up at seven, eight hours of sleep. And we're like, eh, that's actually seven hours of sleep in most cases. And so, you know, I think to us, that's the most important insight we've gotten from tracking our sleep. It's fun to look at your heart rate variability and some of the other metrics, but we don't really do anything with that data. You know, what we know is that if we've gotten eight hours sleep, we check the box. Mm. And then do you want me to tell you about my weighted blanket? Do it. So uh, I have a thing called a chili blanket made by a company called Sleep Me, and it's a weighted blanket. So it makes me feel like I'm sleeping inside a womb. Um, so it's a heavy weighted blanket. But for anyone who's used a weighted blanket, the downfall of them is that you wake up two hours into the night and you're a thousand degrees and you have to cast the weighted blanket off, or if you need to get up and go to the bathroom, it's like a workout to get the blanket off your body. But you know, this thing is actually cycling cold water through the blanket. And so you can keep it on your body for the whole night. Even if you, you know, even if you warm up at night and you don't wake up in wake up sweating or have to cast the blanket off, you know, but I, I would say this is definitely a sleep optimization strategy. The things that we do that are much more consistent and important are the basics. You know, we make sure our room is cold. We both sleep with an eye mask. 
We like to sleep with earplugs. We basically want to make our bedroom like a cocoon that is just focused on sleeping. Only if you want to be awesome. Only if you want to be awesome. The and, and probably to micro any favorite sleep masks that you both enjoy. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, I'll I'll hit that one. I love the Mindfold. We first we actually live in a community in Marin County that is home to the National Center for Guide Dogs for the Blind, and so all over our neighborhood are people training guide dogs. And the way that they train guide dogs is actually by using this mask called the Mindfold mask. And I was like, oh okay, well if it if it can work to train guide dogs like this, thing's got to keep light out. So, you know, I, that's oh. the one I use. Kelly doesn't love the way that one feels on his face, so he uses. Do you know what brand do you use? Manta. He uses a Manta. But really anything to just cut a bunch of that extra. Don't be light. precious. Don't be precious. You know they're cheap. Two bucks, no, give no, it a I, shot. I, I wear I wear eye mask and, and earplugs. <laughs> and as everyone, well. you're gonna have to train yourself to do it. That's okay. Yeah, it does it's yeah, get, give it a few nights because it's hard to get used to it at the beginning. And then once you get used to it, every you know, room, the rest you sleep in, the rest the, of your life is dark. The other thing too, the, to the extent that we are like children, you know, everybody when they have little kids, they totally understand what a sleep routine is, right? You take the bath, you do the, you know, yes. read the book, right? All kids are in a sleep routine. Well, we don't lose that when we become adults. And so one of the things we love about the eye mask and earplug routine is we take those things with us traveling and it really helps our sleep when we're traveling because, you know, it's, we've taught our brains that putting the eye mask on and the earplugs in is one of the ways we signal ourselves to sleep. And if we're in a weird environment, it's like this little thing we've brought from home that signals our brain. Okay. You may be in a weird Ramada Inn in Dallas, Texas, but you can still sleep. And never, ever forget it because it <laughs> sucks. <laughs> yeah. True fact. We've done that too. I want to be very respectful of your time. Is there anything that jumps out at you? We went pretty wide, pretty deep through the book. So much more to cover, but is there anything that you want to make sure that we didn't leave out uh, for the listeners? Well, I just wanted to add that I think our goal here was to make you know, and what we think is so revolutionary about this book is that it's comprehensive. You can certainly pick up a book on sleep and exercise and nutrition. In fact, you can pick up thousands of books on all those subjects, every single chapter. But we wanted to say, okay, we, we want to give people a book that they can put on their coffee table. They can revisit multiple times a year and check in to see how they're doing on these basics of health. And we think that's what's really so unique about this book. It's like, you can just read this one book you can keep an eye on the things in this book and you're going to be pretty good and pretty durable as a human. We also created a video companion course on builttomove.com. So you can just enter your email and we'll give you a little drip email every day for 21 days explaining the challenge and just supporting the book. That's perfect. I thought a uh, videos for the for the some of the tests and uh, would be an absolute yes. beautiful addition so to hear you did that is perfect. And for our listeners, where can they find you guys? Uh, we are at builttomove.com. And you can learn more about our other company, The Ready State, there as well. Kelly is at The Ready State on Instagram. And I am at Juliet Starrett on Instagram. Perfect. All of that will be in our show notes. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you, man. Thanks so much, Clint. If you like the podcast, you'll love our new newsletter, The Growth Guide. Every Thursday, straight to your inbox with the goal to help you be better, achieve more, and become financially free. Check it out at our website, thegrowth.guide. Subscribe and learn more.